But I want to talk today about how to walk in greater blessing. How to walk in greater blessing. Now this title, depending on what church background you come from, might be a trigger for you. How to walk in greater blessing. Well, what does he mean? After all, there's a lot of pastors out there that will show you the three easy steps to greater blessing in your life. There's a lot of pastors out there that have written books. If you pay them $19.95 for their new release, hard copy, maybe even a little signature, and if you buy it quickly, you can find out how to live a life of extreme blessing. And I titled this message, this phrase, on purpose, because I want us to unravel this statement and what it means. How to walk in greater blessing. So often in the church, we are taught about blessing. We use the terms bless, uh, blessing in our church. When people, I, I, it's so interesting to me, I, I say, hey, how you doing? And people go, blessed? I want to go, what do you mean by that? What, is that? what does that look like? I want some of that, Right? People, we, we use the word bless, blessing in church, and we ought to because this is a part of the faith that we live and the work that God does. And there's a number of preachers, TV writers, book writers, all that stuff that, that will talk a lot about blessing and often those people refer to blessing only as material blessing. If you define blessing in your de definition of blessing is limited to material blessing, you have missed a large portion of what blessing really is. And you are limited in your understanding and therefore you will be limited in your experience of blessing. And so I wanna, I wanna talk about that a little bit today. While it is true God it does bless materially in our lives, provisions, there's so much more to this issue of God's blessings and benefits that it provides in our life. Why is it that the American church zeroes in so much on material blessing? And why don't we ever consider this hard fact in the scriptures that smacks us in the face every time we open it and read it? That the, the people who teach us about blessing, who wrote about blessing, who were the apostles and launched the church and teach us and define for us what blessing is, why do almost all of those people, in fact, I would say all of those people have very little material blessing in their life? How could they teach us about blessing when they didn't have any? That's something we need to pay attention to because maybe... Just maybe blessing is bigger than what I've got in my wallet. What numbers are in my checking account? How we walk in more blessing, that's what today is all about. Paul is sitting in prison. Not many material blessings in prison. He's sitting in prison and he wrote these words in Ephesians 1 verse 3. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for the spiritual blessings that Christ has brought us from heaven. I pray that I could sp speak like that sitting in prison with no material blessings. He is speaking of a blessing that is in his life that has nothing to do with material blessings and we've got to catch what he's talking about. It took, uh, if you look into the lives of many of the apostles' lives, you're not going to find any material blessing or wealth, but they were blessed, and they spoke of a blessing that God did in their lives, and they taught us through the scriptures and through their writings about the way of blessing, how, what blessing is and what we need to do to walk in it. Just by their very lives, the disciples show us that blessing is not material blessings, but that blessing can be experienced is a spiritual blessing. Blessing is defined as spiritual good. Spiritual good that comes as we walk in God's commands. Amen. Spiritual good that comes as we walk in God's commands. It is also the favor of God in our lives that goes before us and comes behind us as we follow his ways. 
Blessing was originally understood in the first story of the Bible that we really understand the concept of blessing and how it works in the life of Abraham. And so if you want to understand blessing, go all the way back to Genesis and start to read about the story of Abraham. Abraham demonstrated radical obedience to the Lord. And he was told by God to take his son Isaac, who was the miracle child. They were not able to have kids. His wife was barren, and God gives them a son. God gives them a son of promise. And that is the miracle son. Abraham is looking at this son, who's a miracle from God, who is a blessing from God. And God looks at him, Abraham, and says, I want you to take that miracle, son, and I want you to walk up on top of that mountain. I want you to make an altar, and I want you to sacrifice your son before me. Abraham didn't understand. And quite frankly, you and I wouldn't understand. And oftentimes, we don't understand. When God ask something radical from us. We don't understand. We don't understand the purpose. We don't understand what it's going to accomplish. We don't understand. It feels silly, the things that he's asking us to do. But nevertheless, Abraham chopped the wood, got his son, and walked up the hill. Think about that for a second. Radical obedience. He did not understand but he obeyed. And at the very last second, as Abraham was about ready to kill his promised miracle son, God stopped him and provided a goat in the bushes. And I want you to listen to what God said to him. God said to Abraham, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son. And because you have done this, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the, sea, uh, uh, as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed because you obeyed me. If we're going to understand the concept of blessing, we have to understand that story right there. Because that is, the, that is the original concept of where blessing comes in. And every story of blessing, every teaching of blessing has its roots tied back into this story. God, Abraham was asked by God to do something radical, to obey radically, and he did it. And because he did it, blessing came. Blessing comes out of obedience. This is something important for us to understand. This blessing that Abraham had was passed through generations to God's people. It was the blessing that made way for the people of God to have the promised land. It was the blessing that has been available to all those who have feared God and followed God like Abraham. And because of Christ, this same blessing, Abraham's blessing, is still alive on the earth, living in us. We, followers of Christ, get to experience the blessing of Abraham. Talk about blessing. Think about the power of that for a second. We don't have time to preach on this all day, but just think about the power. Because of your radical obedience, your children and your children's children and their children's children have blessing because of what you've done. That's the concept of blessing. That's how blessing works, and that's how to have increased blessing in your life. But, was br uh, but what brought this blessing of Abraham? Abraham's obedience, his willingness to give what was most valuable possession in his life to God. His willingness to give his most valuable possession to God in his life that God asked him to give. Abraham was already blessed. He didn't, I mean, did he really need more blessing? Did, what, didn't he have blessing already? The son was a blessing. God had already done a work of blessing in his life. But God says, I'm going to bless you even greater, even more. Will you take the blessing I gave you and will you give it back to me? Out of that obedience, greater blessing came. God has already blessed you and me today. If you're in this room and you're walking in salvation and you're walking in grace and you're walking in forgiveness and you're walking in the eternal hope that God has that you're going to be with him in heaven forever someday, that is blessing. You are walking in blessing. You have received blessing and showers of blessing have come into your life. Amen? Amen. Just like Abraham, we've already been blessed. Yeah. But God calls us to greater blessing and wants to lead us on the path of greater blessing. 
There's been a path that's been laid out through scripture uh, and it's called the way of blessing, meaning if you will walk on this path, there is greater blessing. If you walk on this path, more blessing will come into your life. There's also a way laid out in scripture of the path that removes us from blessing. If we'll walk on this path, blessing will be removed from your life and you will take on the consequences of your own choice, of your own will, and your own way because you walked outside the path of blessing. This is, the, this is the truth that Scripture teaches us. And it's been laid out. The path of blessing has been laid out for us. When we, like Abraham, are able to give him what is hardest for us to give him when he asks us for it. That's the clarifier. You hearing this? When we give to God what is hardest for us to give when he asks for it, this is the place where we will have determined what we place our trust in. And this will be the place where greater blessing will come. Last week we talked about being the light. Today I want to share with you how we can multiply the light. How we can multiply the light in our world through the kingdom builders and the things that we do through kingdom builders here. And my prayer today is that as you, uh, uh, that you will ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want to say to me about what you want me to do, how you want me to participate. Because like Abraham, as we follow and obey what he tells us, that's where greater blessing in our personal lives and in our church lives. So I wanna give you three ways to greater blessing today that I find in scripture. And these are not the only three. These are the three we're talking about today, all right? Number one, give what you cannot keep to get what will last forever. Give what you cannot keep to gain or get what, you, what will last forever. Last week we talked about how God called us to, the light, to be the light of the world. And a few sentences after the verse I read to you last week, he makes this comment. Jesus makes this comment in his very first sermon called the uh, Sermon on the Mound. Listen to what it says, uh, Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasure in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Did you catch it? Give what you can't hold on to that's gonna be taken from you to gain what will last forever. Why would Jesus make this statement about material possessions in his first sermon? Why not wait for it till later when they're more mature, when they understand the kingdom better, when they caught the whole vision? Why wouldn't they just wait until they got a little bit more spiritual faith and maturity under them? Why does he wait? Why does he teach them about this way of radical giving and obedience in this way in his very first sermon? There's two reasons. First, Jesus was wanting them to understand what held greater value in their lives. If they lived for the life they had on earth, they would find out that it was not as important as they thought. So he wanted them to find true value instead of a fake uh, promise value that fell through. He wanted them to find what true value looked like. And they would, he wanted them to know that they were going to experience loss at some point. Loss of things that they had tried to hold on to. And when they lost those things, they were going to realize that maybe, just maybe, they had put their ladder up against the wrong wall and pursued the wrong thing. And he wanted them to catch this early at the beginning of their faith before they experienced that great loss in their life. Secondly, Jesus was dealing with the human condition a human condition that we're all aware of that will rob them of eternal things, that will rob you and me from eternal things. The spiritual condition was selfishness. He knew that selfishness would not be something that they would want to deal with. And that that wasn't something that they could wait to deal with because selfishness would wage war against the kingdom life that he was calling them to live. And they would miss kingdom life if they allowed selfishness to have a place in their life. So he calls them to radical obedience in the area of giving before he begins to deepen their faith in maturity. This is why Jesus deals with it in his very first sermon. One of the ways Jesus illustrated this was by dealing with material possessions. 
He says, let's talk about your material possessions for a second. He says, all your material possessions, all those things you worked so hard for, all those things that you tried to gain and store it for yourself, all those things that tried to advance you to the next level of success in life, all of those things are things that will not last. They will come to an end. You will experience lost. He goes, even things like insects and vermin, mice and rats will destroy them. Any of you ever had one of those in your attic before? Here's one thing I am convinced of. If you don't deal with them, you're going to regret it later. And it's true in our own life too. If we don't deal with the things that will come and rob from us, and if we don't deal with our attitude on material possessions and how much they mean to us, when we see them go, it's going to devastate us to a point where we can't recover. And Jesus says, put the value on the right thing because all your material possessions that you think are so important that you're working your whole life to gain will eventually go away. They will either go away because because they'll they'll just wear and tear, right? Listen, we can pay car payments on a car for 10 years and pretty soon, guess what? It's not gonna be worth what we paid for it when we made all those payments. We're gonna watch the rust start to happen. We're gonna start the paint start to scratch. We're gonna start to see the tears in the, street, in the seats because kids are hard on cars. Have you noticed this? Everybody's slapping each other. It's awesome. It's awesome. And Jesus wanted to deal with material possessions and he wanted to deal with their selfishness. He was dealing with their desire to have more for themselves because it would not lead them to the life that they desired. And I think uh, if Jesus were here today, he would preach the same message to the church and it might even be one of his first messages he ever spoke to us when he walked in here. Stop living for yourself. Stop living for material possessions. There's something greater to live for. I want to talk to you about a couple of really hard facts that we have to understand that reflect to us the health of the American church. These are reality that we need to deal with. And if we compare these realities to what Jesus taught in his first sermon, we will understand there's some things that need adjustment in the church. I want you to know something today. Do you know that today... Born again believers, not just people that wear a title. They say, I'm trusting in the salvation of Jesus for my life. I'm a born again believer. Give less of the percent of their income today than they did during the Great Depression. Of their income to God's work. One out of every three born again Christians who attend church regularly did not give any money to the church or to its church-related ministries in the last year. In America, only 12% of born-again believers give a full tithe. A tithe means 10%. You take your income, you give 10%, the first and best. That's what we talked about, and we've talked about that before. But there's 12% of born-again Christians in the church that, that do that, that give a full tithe. And what's interesting is this. The less people make, the more likely they are to give. If you make less than $25,000 a year, you're eight times more likely to give to your church. And of those 12% tithers in the church, 77% of those 12% of the tithers are the ones that are funding all the other ministries of the church. So they already give their tithe and they give above and beyond their tithe to fund 77% of the rest of the ministries of the church. Interesting. These are just facts that are about the American church. I'm not talking, these aren't neighbor church facts. These are American church, but certainly neighbor church falls into that. Why you say, Pastor Lance, are you scolding us? No, I'm trying to reveal to us why Jesus would deal with this in the Sermon on the Mount. This is why he would talk about that. Because he wanted us to understand that if we did not catch this principle of understanding that there's something more important than material possessions, we would start to claim stuff for our own and hold it to ourselves. 
And if we did that, we would experience great loss in our life because the more we try to hold on to it, the less we get to keep it. And this is a spiritual principle he's wanting us to catch. When Jesus talks about how we handle our material possessions, he's not dealing with a money issue, he's dealing with a spiritual health issue. That's important for us to understand. Jesus is, uh, it says that rather than trying to keep what you will eventually lose, the spiritually healthy thing to do in all of our lives is to invest into things that build the kingdom and last forever. The reason this leads to blessing is because our lives get to be a part of seeing something added to the kingdom. We get to be blessed by that. About two weeks ago, I was having a conversation just, uh, we're talking about life with uh, somebody in our church, and uh, they were particularly happy and joyful this day when I was talking to them. And I'm like, what is up with you? Why are you so happy? And they're just like, oh man, so, I don't know, man, I just, I'm so encouraged. And I said, what are you encouraged about? He goes, you know, a couple of weeks ago at church, we had a baptism out there in the parking lot and there was a young person, there was a couple young people that, get, that, that were baptized in the baptism tank. And they go, yeah, wasn't that awesome? That was so cool. It was encouraging. And we got to hear a little bit of the story that the young person had hit the end of their rope, had hit the rock bottom of their life, had made some bad choices that led to bad places. And they realized, I need God. They called Pastor Jeff. They came to youth group because they had been here before a long time ago. And they showed up got saved, and four days later got baptized. And I said, yeah, that was encouraging. He goes, Pastor Jeff told me that the way they came to our church a few years ago was they got sponsored to go to snow camp. I sponsored kids to go to snow camp. I got to help make that happen. And I was watching as this, 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 this friend of mine was sharing this joy. It was just like bubbling up in him. And it was just like, I, I can't win snow camp. I need to write some sponsorship checks. <laughs> because all of a sudden, the word blessing meant something different. It wasn't about what was in the bank account. It was about what it accomplished in the kingdom of God and I got to be a part of that. Amen. I got to be a part of that. See, the blessing increases when we understand blessing is greater than just material possessions. Do you know why we don't give and invest in the kingdom of God in greater ways? Oftentimes it's because we're afraid. Can we just be honest about that? We're afraid we might not have enough or not have enough for us. It's, it's not uh, me saying that, if, uh, that it, is G- it is Jesus saying this. It's not me saying this, it's Jesus saying this. A few verses later, after telling us to invest in the kingdom of God, he says this, don't worry. Listen to Matthew chapter 6, 28. This is right after he tells us to give and to invest into the kingdom of God. He says this, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of those. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after such things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus is dealing with the things that keep us from being generous towards his kingdom. The things that keep us from keeping stuff to ourselves and storing up to a point where it becomes unspiritually, uh, it becomes spiritually unhealthy. He says, there's selfishness that lives in you. And you're afraid. But trust me, because watch what I can do in your life. Seek my kingdom and the building of my kingdom first. All those stuff you're worried about is going to get added to your life. Can I just tell you something today? Don't let fear determine your faithfulness. Don't let fear determine your faithfulness. Generosity is a trust issue, not a supply issue. Did you catch that? 
Generosity is a trust issue, not a supply issue. God has already spoken to us that he'll add those things to our lives. Generosity is, will I trust him with what he's given me? Abraham had to trust that the miracle son that God gave him, God was trustworthy of him in order to walk in the way of blessing. Number two, let your generosity be big enough for God to be involved. For God to be involved. Paul spends three chapters talking about generosity to the church in Corinth because they had resources, but they were not mature in this area of giving. And so he talks to them for three whole chapters about the issue of generosity and about giving because they were reluctant to give. They were reluctant to be generous to the Lord. Paul was taking a collection for the poor and the hurting in Jerusalem. Persecution had, had, had broke out in Jerusalem. People that were serving God and following God were getting their lives taken away from them. They were getting arrested. They were getting put in jail. They were, they were having, the government was t- stealing things for them. They were trying to make them so miserable that they would walk away from their faith. And there's people that were suffering, people that were poor, people that were hurting in Jerusalem. And Paul says, we need to help these people. And, P- and so he, he begins to take a collection from all the churches outside of Israel but Paul goes on to tell the church in Corinth whose money, uh, 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 who has money about churches in Macedonia to make his case. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar, there's some churches in Macedonia, and they were known to have, like, nothing. They were poor churches. They were churches that struggled, churches that had been through a lot. In fact, the reputation of the churches in Macedonia were considered to be in deep poverty, who had gone through great affliction, And Paul is talking to the church in Corinth that's got great wealth, but don't want to give it. And he says, hey, before you give, let me tell you about some churches in Macedonia. Let me tell you about what God's doing in their life and in their heart and in their faith. And he begins to tell them about these churches that in the midst of their deep poverty, in the midst of their great affliction, their generosity was amazing. And they gave generously in abundant joy beyond the expectations that even Paul thought that they were capable of. Why does he tell them about this church? That they don't know, that they can't relate to, Because he wants them to know that their generosity has nothing to do with their circumstance or even lack of of material possessions. It's about the heart and letting God have the opportunity to do something supernaturally in them. Paul says, these guys, I didn't think they were even capable of giving that kind of, but when they heard about the plight of their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, they gave with such joy, they gave with such generosity, they gave in such a way that God is gonna have to repay them back on the backside because they gave so sacrificially. They gave in a way that God has to be involved. He says, I wanna talk to you about your heart, Church of Corinth, because you've got all the possessions in the world, but you can't part with them. You can't part with them. Paul can hear the calculators going off in their head. You know those thoughts. I have to save for this over here. I got this thing coming up. I got this thing I'm planning for. I don't know if I can do all this and afford this much. He can hear their worry about what will happen if they release what's in their hand now. Maybe they won't have enough when it comes for what they need later. And Paul simply wants to stop their calculations, stop the worry, stop and remember who God is and what he has said and what he has taught us about generosity and our commitment to it. You see, no one can figure out the equation of the Macedonians. No one can figure it out. Listen to it. This is basically what Paul says. Macedonians, great affliction plus deep poverty plus grace of God equals abundant joy and generous giving. That's, nobody can figure that equation out. When you experience tr- spiritual transformation and spiritual maturity, then difficult circumstances do not become roadblocks for us to use in our lack of, uh, and excuses for us to use in our lack of generosity. They are only opportunities to watch God's miracle provision as we give. 
Paul goes on to address their thoughts in Scripture. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 10 through 11, Now he who supplies the seed for the sower and the bread for, the, uh, for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness and you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Do you hear what Paul's saying to the church? God, who gives you what you already have, he, look, he gave you everything you've got, is going to call you to be generous, and he's going to increase his blessing in your life so you can be even more generous than you think you can right now. He's going to increase your harvest. He's going to increase, and he's going to be, enrich you so that you can be even more generous in every occasion you have the opportunity. Some of you are newer to our church and you don't know a church member that was a very important part of our family. But I remember her and I will never, ever forget my conversations and relationship with Esther Ferris. Oh, yeah. Esther had the reputation and not one person that knew her did not know her to be a generous woman. She did everything she could to do what she felt God called her to do. And she didn't have much to do it with. And she got a passion, she got a passion one day to see young people who couldn't afford to go be a part of a convention and go get fed spiritually to have a way to, be, to make it there. And rather than go and ask everybody for money, she would go collect whatever donations she could find in food, not money, and she would make these plates. She would make food plates by the hundreds every year by the hundreds and she would sell these food plates and all the proceeds she would get for these, for these uh, proceeds of these food, she would just give it all. I suspect it was even more than what she got from the food plates. To see young people go have an encounter with God. And I w listened after she passed away of young person after young person after young person talk about the difference that she made in their life. It was her generosity. You see, what you don't know is, is that during that time, she was struggling with kidney failure. She was on dialysis. Oh, she, if there was ever a person that had circumstances that they could blame for not being generous, it was Esther. She had been through a lot. She had overcome a ton. She, it, but, but it didn't stop her. And I'll never forget the phone call I got from her one day, and uh, it was the only time me and Esther ever disagreed. Ever. The only time. She called me one day in my office, and she said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound good. That sounds very serious. And she says, Pastor, the Lord has told me that I'm supposed to do something. At the moment in time, we were over there meeting in a gym, and we had just decided to lease this building. And we needed to raise $60,000 to buy the chairs, to do some of the stage stuff, and all that stuff. We had to raise sixty. dollars And at that time, $60,000 sounded impossible to us. And we said, but we feel like we got to do this. She called me up. She says, Pastor Lance, I was praying the other day, and the Lord told me I'm supposed to give $1,000 to the, to the account for you guys to move. And I said, absolutely not. I won't take it. She goes, oh, yes, you will. <laughs> I said, I, Esther, I love you. There's no one I know in life that is more generous than you. But unfortunately, at this moment and this time, I know what you're walking through. I will not take that money. She says, Pastor, are you telling me with all that you know about the Bible, you're going to keep me from my blessing? I said, Pastor, I, I said, Esther, how dare you get spiritual on me? <laughs> I, said, I said, Esther, you need it more than we need it. God will find another way. He, she says, God spoke. I'm going to do it, and you're going to take it. I said, okay. So I, said, I hung up the phone. I said, Lord, whatever you do, you give that money back to Esther somehow. And she called me. After she wrote the check, she called me three weeks later. She said, Pastor, the Lord's so good. I got twice the amount from places I didn't even know where it was coming from. 
It, God just blessed me. And I went, praise God. And I'm telling you what, I watched this lady who, ha- who like the Macedonians, had great affliction, great trials, great struggles, every three days a week on dialysis. That's right. Listen to the voice of the Lord like Abraham and said, whatever you ask of me, I'm going to do it. You're sitting in her blessing right now. You're sitting in her blessing. She said, Pastor, I know there's going to be people that are going to get saved in that church. And I know there's going to be people that are going to grow in their faith and their, with Jesus Christ in that church. And I know God's going to do awesome stuff in that church. And I want to be a part of it. We are experiencing Esther's blessing today. That's greater blessing greater blessing. That's how it works today. And I'm so, I, 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 will, I will never forget her heart and the way that she uh, taught me. She taught me about greater blessing. It's the difference between living open-handed or close-handed. Close-handed isolates and restricts life. Open-handed makes room for God to be involved. And we get blessing watching God's work in our midst because we were generous with what he already gave us. Number three, Be confident that great investment today leads to greater rewards tomorrow. From the time that I was a young man, I'd been advised by people, and maybe you were too. You need to start sending money away for retirement, Pastor Lance. You need to get that retirement going because if you put it in there now, it's going to be worth a lot when you retire. And I'm going, man, that sounds really good. The only problem is, is I'm working right now two jobs, one youth pastor job that pays $300 a month and a retail job that doesn't pay a whole lot more than that, and I'm getting ready to get married. I thought to myself, there's no way that's going to happen. But you know what? From the very beginning when Tina and I got married, we just a little bit in the retirement. We're 24 years in. It was just 24 this last September. I'm glad we did that. I wish I would have done more. I wish I would have done more. You see, this is the principle. And everybody says, as long as I've ever, as I've ever understood money and finances, everybody I've ever known says, you gotta stick it in there, you gotta stick it in there, you gotta get that retirement going, you gotta get prepared, you gotta get set, you gotta get ready for when you're retired and no more income's coming in. Until 2008. And everybody went, I thought I could count on this. I thought it was guaranteed. I thought they told me if I just did that every month, it would be sitting there waiting for me. All those people that retired in 2008 found out how vicious this world can be when it comes to our material possessions. That's what Jesus told us. That it'll rust, rot, and be destroyed See, the kingdom doesn't work like retirement. It's not how it works. There's verse after verse that teaches us if we will make the investment today, we will see dividends and return on investment tomorrow that cannot be stolen, cannot be taken away, cannot be removed no matter how hard the enemy tries. Listen to Proverbs 11, 24 through 25. One person gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. You see, the problem when we hear a verse like this is we have these thoughts in our head. So let's just call them out. That doesn't make sense. I know people that are not generous, and they are the stingiest people I've ever known, and they haven't come to poverty. They still have lots of wealth. That doesn't make sense. And I know people who have been super generous and they're not wealthy. You see, we do calculations like this to determine the reality or the truthfulness of the scriptures rather than to play out what Jesus and understand what, uh, what God was tr- really trying to say here in problem, uh, Proverbs. The problem is, is that if you know, uh, is, is that how you see this verse, uh, the, if you don't understand how you see this verse, then you're gonna miss it. It says that you will prosper and be refreshed. Prosperity is about success, and the success depends on how you define it. 
how do you define success? I want to show you how I define success. A while ago, a long time ago, I pulled this out. If you were in service, you know what this is. This is my investment portfolio. I got a little file in my desk that I keep. And every time somebody writes me a letter about how my investment changed their lives for eternity, I take the letter and I put it in this file. And I got letter after letter. Thank you, Pastor Lance, for the investment. Thank you for helping me with this. Thank you for taking care of that need in my life. Thank you for taking those hours and speaking truth. I have letters from teenagers in here. I have letters from parents. I have a letter from a mayor of Eugene. I have a letter from friends, coworkers, family members. All these letters represent something eternal that was produced by something that God told me to give. It's my investment portfolio. You wouldn't want to see the other investment portfolio. It's not that great. But this one is prosperity in my book. When I get to heaven and I get to stand next to some of these people, I'm going to go, man, that was so worth it. That was so worth it. That was worth every penny. That was worth every hour. That was worth every heartache. That was worth every trial. That was worth it. It was worth it. I want you to understand something today. Each one of you, spiritually, have an investment portfolio. Yours might not be physical, but it, it exists. And everything we do to invest into the kingdom of God pays dividends. Prosperity. Refreshing. Do you know how refreshing it is when you get a letter that says, what God did through you changed my life. You just walk in a different kind of joy. I don't know if you're missing joy in your life today, but I can tell you one sure way to find joy. By investing in somebody that needs your investment. By giving away the kingdom of God. By investing into the kingdom of God. And look at what he does into your life. What you give today will pay off tomorrow. This is how the kingdom of God works. This is how God's kingdom gets built. Luke chapter 6 verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and runneth over. It will be poured out into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And I'm going to tell you something today. Every pastor you have heard that read you that verse and only referred to money didn't give you the full story. Pressed down, shaken together, poured in your lap is not about money. It's about the investment portfolio. Give and you will get to see prosperity. You will get to see dividends. Don't make the mistake in only interpreting this pastor uh, passage as more material possessions. Be encouraged that there are things that are so much greater, so much more refreshing, so much more meaningful, so much more worth taking the risk for because it was hang, uh, it was the, uh, the kingdom of God was hanging in the balance in somebody's life and now that God has promised that he will restore lives, he will change lives, he will bring lives into the kingdom because you stepped out and listened to his voice and did what he asked you to do. That's called the way of blessing. And that's the greatest blessing of all. The blessing that goes on for generations and generations. God wants to use you to bless generations and generations. God says that through Abraham's blessing, all nations would be blessed. That's you and that's me as you walk out God's obedience in your life. I want to encourage you today. God wants to call us to the way of blessing. And that's really what Kingdom Builders is about, but it's bigger than Kingdom Builders. It's about how you live your life and how you invest it at work, in your family, workplace, as you invest your time, your energy, your love into people rather than keeping it to yourself. Ashley, would you come up and up? And would you stand with me this morning?
I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. My whole life, my whole life, I was told to think about my material investments in my retirement account. It was good advice. It's good wisdom. But how many of you, like me, haven't had a lot of people talk to you about your spiritual investment account? Today, I believe the Lord's calling us to consider that today. What's in our investment account spiritually? How many deposits have we made? It's time for us to address the things that go on in our lives that Jesus addressed right from his very first sermon. Don't store up for yourselves things that aren't going to last. Don't make things that are only have only earthly value the biggest priority of your life. Because eventually you're going to have to say goodbye to it. Let's think about the greater investment. Let's think about the greater treasure. Let's deny that selfishness that wants to creep up inside of us. And let's say, Lord, if you'll ask me, I'll do it. Even if I don't understand, even like Abraham, Lord, if I don't understand and it doesn't make any sense, if you tell me, I'll do it. Because, Lord, I believe in your ways, the way of blessing. I believe, Lord, that you know how to spend my life better than I do. I believe, Lord, in your perfect plan. And I believe, Lord, that you're raising me up to be successful and prosperous in the kingdom as I learn to give away what you've given me. Would you just begin to talk to the Lord about that today? Maybe it starts out with repentance. I don't know. But just talk to the Lord for a second about your spiritual investment today in your life. Talk to him about that portfolio. Talk to him about the people you want to see added to the kingdom because of your investment. Say, Lord, would you build your kingdom through me? Through me? Yes, Lord. Lord, I pray for us as a church. I pray for me as an individual. For all of us, Lord, we have to we have to reconcile these verses and what they mean for us. But Lord Jesus, I believe with all of my heart that you are calling this church to a greater level of spiritual investment than ever before. That Lord, we are going to see people added to the kingdom because we decided to walk in the way of blessing like Abraham. God, we confess today, everyone in this room, we are blessed. We're blessed with your grace. We're blessed with your goodness. We're blessed with your forgiveness. We're blessed with your salvation. We're blessed with the eternal promise, Lord God, of heaven, eternity with you. We're blessed. We've been set free from our sin. We've been unchained from our past. We've been given a fresh start, given a new life. Lord, we're blessed. But what we are also convinced of today is like Abraham, there's a greater path of blessing to give ourselves away so that your kingdom can be built. God, help us do that with greater measure than ever before. There's a great picture in Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah is standing before the throne of God and he makes this statement. Lord, here am I. Use me. If that's your prayer today, as I just finish in prayer, 
but you just all eyes closed, you're just having a private moment between you and God, but you would like to join Isaiah's prayer. Here am I. Here am I. Everything I have, everything I own, all of my energy, all of my efforts, Lord, here am I. Use me. If you'd like to join Isaiah's prayer today as I close in prayer, we just put your hands out in a, in a, a just a, a receiving surrender position, just like this. So Lord, you see us. We're making the statement, God, today, here am I. Lord, when I say here am I, God, I'm saying all of me, all that I own, all that I have, all that I've considered mine, my time, my talent, my possessions. Use me. Use us. We want to see your kingdom multiplied. We want to see your gospel advance. We want to see people set free. We want to see people come to know the Lord, not just in the United States, but all around the world. Lord, in Iran and in Russia and in Africa. Lord, in Australia, in South America. God, we want to see people come to know you. And Lord, somehow, I don't get it, but you get it. Lord, somehow we have the ability to be a part of that and experience blessing as we sow into it. So God, use us, I pray. In Jesus' name, we surrender before the throne. Amen. 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 Here's the deal. We're not doing an altar call today, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this. It's super simple. It's our kingdom builders. All it does is show you whatever we're going to give. Give. That's how it's going to go around the world to bless the kingdom of God. Just take it and pray on it. If you're going to be back tonight, bring it with you. If you're not, bring it with you on Sunday. We'll have extras if you forget. And we're going to find out and see, God, what's our part of kingdom builders, all right? God bless you. Be a kingdom builder today as you leave. Amen.